The Swedish Carolians, they got their name from Carolus, which is a Latin form of the name Charles, because they served King Charles XI and his successor, Charles XII of Sweden. Specifically from the year 1680, when King Charles XI instituted an absolute monarchy in Sweden and started a series of military reforms, all the way to the death of Charles XII in 1718. They are most known for fighting with Charles XII in his campaigns in the Great Northern War. During said war, they achieved a series of impressive victories, often being considerably outnumbered, and they managed to establish themselves as one of the most feared and respected armies in Europe at the time. Clad in their distinctive blue and yellow uniforms, which are the national colors of Sweden, they were famous for their high morale and aggressive tactics. They were split into three branches, infantry, cavalry and artillery, and they were taught to fight closely alongside each other, counting on teamwork and mutual support to win their battles. Recruitment was carried out through the allotment system. In this system, Swedish farmers would provide the crown with a soldier and they would also equip and support him, including giving the soldier a cottage and a garden plot. Each cavalryman was additionally provided with a horse. In exchange for this, they were granted a reduction in taxes. This allotment system provided Charles XI with a professional army of 18,000 infantrymen and 8,000 cavalrymen. In addition, he also got 6,600 seamen, and Finland provided an additional 7,000 infantrymen, 3,000 cavalrymen and 600 seamen. Most of the infantrymen were musketeers, but one-third of them were pikemen. The musketeers typically carried a sword for close quarters combat, but later in 1704 they began using bayonets. A dozen of the tallest and strongest men in each company would be designated grenadiers. The problem with Sweden was that it didn't have a large population, especially compared to its biggest enemy at the time, Russia. As such, they had to focus on quality over quantity. Discipline was very strict and the Carolians were drilled relentlessly to ensure no one broke in combat or fired before they were ordered to do so. Punishments for crimes such as looting, insubordination or blasphemy were very harsh. Another very interesting thing is that the soldiers were typically recruited from the same region, which helped to ensure a strong esprit de corps, which means they had a strong morale and loyalty to their fellow soldiers, because being from the same region, a lot of them were friends before they got recruited. They were also required to be very pious, since religion was described as the mortar that held the units together. Religious services were held before battles, and the Carolians were told that they had God's favor. All of these factors combined together resulted in almost suicidal courage on the battlefield. Often, the steady advance of the Carolian infantry was enough to break the weaker opponents and make them flee. Their tactics were very aggressive, since they had to make up for their low numbers. They used shock tactics, counting on firepower and aggression to overcome their numerous rivals. Victory depended on close teamwork between infantry, cavalry and artillery. Small caliber cannons would advance with the infantry, adding to their firepower. A Carolian infantry regiment consisted of roughly 1200 men, divided into two battalions of 600 men each. Prior to battle, they were usually formed into four ranks. Like I've said before, one third of them were pikemen equipped with swords and a five and a half meter long pike. They were often placed in the middle of each battalion with musketeers on their flanks to cover them. Grenadiers were placed on the flanks of the musketeers on the left and right of each battalion to protect against enemy cavalry and to toss grenades to break enemy formations. There being one grenadier for 10 musketeers. On occasion, the grenadiers would form their own battalions, such as the Life Grenadier Regiment. At the outbreak of the Great Northern War, every Swedish musketeer was equipped with a sword and a 20mm caliber flintlock musket. But like I've said before, in 1704 a bayonet was issued instead of the sword. The grenadiers were equipped with grenades, swords and flintlock muskets with bayonets. A cavalry regiment consisted of roughly 800 men divided into four squadrons of 200 men each and even further divided into two companies of 100 men each. The Swedish heavy cavalryman was equipped with a rapier, a carbine, two pistols and a cuirass. A dragoon was equipped with a rapier, a musket with a bayonet and two pistols. 
The Drabant Corps was a special unit made up of approximately 150 men under the personal command of King Charles XII, of which he was the captain. To become a private in the corps, you first had to attain the rank of captain in the regular army. The second in command of the corps was a colonel with the title of Captain Lieutenant, which means Lieutenant Captain. They served as the bodyguard of the king and also the elite combat unit, often playing a crucial role in battles, despite their small size. They were famous for fighting to their bitter end, and some of the veterans even carried Charles XII's coffin to Stockholm for burial in 1719. They did also use irregular units, most notably the Vlachs cavalry. However, they were mostly used for reconnaissance missions and to chase down routing enemies. They wore the Swedish standard uniform introduced by Charles XI, which featured blue great coats with yellow cuffs, white breeches and yellow vests. But many regiments wore variants of those clothes. For an example, the dragoons of Bohuslan had green coats and the regiment of Narke Varmland were different because they had red cuffs. The artillery, on the other hand, had grey coats with blue cuffs. As headgear, most soldiers wore tricorn hats or a special cap called a carpus. The artillerymen carried a smaller sword for close combat, called the Hirschfänger. The standard sword issued to the Swedish infantry was a straight one rather than curved, closer to a rapier than a saber, because they were taught to stab an enemy rather than slash at him. Each individual soldier was told not to fear, since if God meant for him to die, he would die, no matter if he tried to dodge bullets or not. A soldier's daily ration would consist of 625 grams of dry bread, 850 grams of butter or pork, one-third of liters of peas and two and a half liters of beer. The butter or pork was often replaced by fish if they were available. Water was avoided since it was often contaminated. Now back to tactics. The Swedish military doctrine of the Carolian era was distinguished by its emphasis on aggressive action and shock tactics, the so-called GAPA, literally go on method. This style of fighting stood in stark contrast to other European armies of the period, which relied increasingly on musketry, delivering a form of volley fire by line infantry to win battles. But the Swedes continued to field large numbers of pikemen throughout the Great Northern War. Even though pikes had largely disappeared from Western European battlefields by that time, similarly they fielded a large proportion of heavy cavalry, which was unusually high by Western standards. Out of the 31,000 Swedish soldiers who participated in Charles XII's Russian campaign, over half of those were cavalrymen. The GAPA tactics enabled the Carolians to repeatedly overcome much larger enemy armies, as the psychological impact of their rapid approach and their steely discipline under enemy fire, combined with their fearsome reputation, often served to intimidate the opposing troops even before physical contact was made. So, if some enemy troops lost their nerve and fled, the panic oftentimes quickly spread throughout the rest of the enemy army. So, a quick success against just one enemy unit could trigger a general rout of the whole army. This served the Swedish army well, as it lacked manpower, especially compared to its larger neighbors like Poland, Lithuania or Russia as Sweden had a much lower population and thus couldn't recruit or replenish its ranks easily. The downsides of the GAPA doctrine were that it required strict discipline on the part of the soldiers. And like any other shock tactic, it was a fundamentally risky strategy, which could backfire on you horribly, especially if a commander misjudged the time or place to mount an attack, or if an assault was mounted against enemies with high morale, or they had good defensive positions. The latter occurred at the Battle of Poltava, where Peter the Great was able to lure the Swedes into mounting an attack against a Russian camp protected by field fortifications, which led to a crushing Swedish defeat. So now how the GAPA actually worked. Infantry attacks were to be executed as follows. In four ranks, with gaps, a Swedish battalion would march smoothly and slowly towards the enemy lines. The enemy would start firing upon them at a distance of approximately 100 meters. The Swedish soldiers were told not to fire until you could see the whites in the enemy's eyes, a range of roughly 50 meters. 
When the marching drums stopped, the two rear ranks would fill the gaps within the two foremost ranks and fire a salvo. Then they drew their swords. The two rear ranks would then move back to their previous position and the two foremost ranks would close the gaps in their lines, after which the battalion would resume their attack. The two foremost ranks would fire their muskets in a final volley when they were within range to charge, a distance of roughly 20 meters. At these ranges, the muskets usually felled many enemy troops, having a great physical and psychological impact on opponents. Instantly, after the final volley, the Carolians would charge the enemy ranks with pikes, bayonets and rapiers. In close combat, the pikemen would have an advantage over their foes, since their weapons were longer. Often full ranks of enemies would flee before physical contact was made, frightened by the long pikes and the fact that the Swedes had so calmly withstood enemy fire. This method was slightly changed during the Great Northern War. The slow march was replaced by running to take fewer casualties and begin combat sooner, while still frightening the enemy with a swift, unflinching advance into their fire. Also, the Swedish firing distance was reduced from 50 meters to 20 meters for the first volley of the rear ranks, who would no longer fall into their previous position behind the front ranks. Instead, they would follow in the gaps within the front ranks. As a result, the battalion attacked in two closely formed ranks, which made the final charge much more effective, as the Carolians would be closely packed together, making a heavier impact than before. The Swedish cavalry also fought in an aggressive way. Instead of forming up knee to knee, they would form up in a tightly packed wedge formation, in order to ensure that their charge struck the enemy with the maximum possible force. And instead of sabers, they were armed with rapiers. Also, in contrast to cavalrymen of other countries, they wouldn't use their pistols during the charge. They would only use them during melee combat after the charge or when pursuing routed enemies. As I've said before, close coordination between infantry, cavalry and artillery was required to break down enemy defenses successfully. Infantry's direct frontal assault would often be coupled with artillery fire. The cannons had to keep pace with infantry and protect them against enemy attacks as they reloaded. The cavalry would strike down the opposing cavalry or charge disorganized infantry, preferably in the flank or rear. Cavalry was also used to cover an army in retreat. If a cavalry attack was repulsed, it would fall back behind friendly infantry to regroup. Religion also played a crucial role in the Carolean army. In addition to swearing fidelity to the Swedish king, the soldiers had to learn and follow the rules and Lutheran doctrines of the Church of Sweden. Those who broke the rules could be punished severely, blasphemy being the capital offense, punishable by death. Prayers and Holy Communion were held before most Carolean battles, and field chaplains could even accompany the men onto the battlefield. After their victory of Narva, many soldiers believed that God had sent the blizzard that led to their victory. But after their catastrophic defeat at Poltava, many of them believed that God had changed sides. But their small numbers would ultimately be their undoing. The Great Northern War would decimate their ranks, and they lacked the manpower to replenish them to win a war of attrition. And after the death of Charles XII, they stopped being referred to as Carolians and the country returned to a constitutional monarchy, ending the absolute monarchy, and the Great Northern War was ended with Sweden's defeat. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, and comment what you want me to cover next.